Hello again. Uh, I would like to uh, invite our um, distinguished set of panelists uh, on stage. Her Excellency Rani al Mashat, Minister of International Cooperation, Egypt. <laughs> Nadia Saeed, General Manager, Bank Al Ittihad, Jordan. <laughs> Laura Lane, President, Global Pub Public Affairs at UPS. <laughs> Michael Okofor. Vice President, Global Sustainability and Packaging, Innovation McCormick. <laughs> and Heike Harmgard from the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development. You're the lucky one. Huh? You're lucky. All the ladies. All the ladies, yeah. <laughs> Hello, and thank you very much for making the time. Um, I'm very, this is the first panel I moderate with four women. <laughs> to be honest, so uh, <laughs> it happened at last. Um, I always had the passion about uh, women in business, uh, women's leadership, and I always wondered why we are so underrepresented in so many sectors. I think the first question that I'm going to ask all of you, um, why women entrepreneurs are important for business, Your Excellency? Uh, well, first I want to um, thank everyone for the great organization and for being here. Um, there's one verse that I like very much, uh, and it's uh, the beginning of research that the IMF did on women participation. And the word that is used is that women participation is macro-critical. And that is extremely important. It's how you move from just uh, thinking about a minority that needs more representation uh, into the economic gains Absolutely. to society from women participation. So I think, I think what has happened over time uh, is the ability for us to quantify in numbers uh, to GDP, to employment, to productivity, to even wage increases to men, because as the society becomes more productive, also pay for men becomes higher. So I believe that um, um, the idea of quantification of this cause is extremely important. It has, it t it has taken um, governments through policies to push the agenda. It has taken international institutions through partnerships, uh, such as the uh, WeFi that we have here. Absolutely. And it takes the private sector as well. So this partnership between the public sector, the private sector, and international institutions is extremely important uh, for us to realize the importance of, uh, or to actually, fee to, to actually get the gains from women participation. Entrepreneurship uh, is, and as we just heard from uh, the two fantastic ladies before, uh, and I salute them, uh, for the work, for example, uh, uh, the, six, the Flat Six Labs in Egypt is an example where um, entrepreneurship is cherished. Um, it is uh, actually pushed forward. Um, and the government itself, through different policies, realizing uh, that entrepreneurship is important, is pushing in that policy framework. Nadia. Well, I think part of the answer is in the introduction or in the question itself. I mean, it is such an underutilized potential. And as such, the up value is huge, and it is so important. So basically, it is so important on the macro, on the micro, on the social, and every level. The other thing I think is that in uh, countries like the Arab world, um, the job creation engine is, is so important. You know, the, the Arab population is very young. In Jordan, for example, youth constitutes 63% of the population. And the unemployment rate in Jordan is at 19%. For women, it is at 30%. For the youth, it is at 40 And no formal sector will be able to generate the number of jobs that is required. Every year, Jordan needs to create 50,000 new jobs. And the kids or the youth have to start creating their jobs and those of, of their colleagues. Today, those 50,000 jobs in Jordan are, are actually filled by males at a rate of 63%, which would take Jordan probably 150 years to reach to the average uh, of the global average of, the, of how, what participation. Why do you think we have this gap? If I can. If, why do we have this gap? Is it because of like your role as a mother, uh, that you have to be at home, um, I don't know, uh, maternity? Actually, there are many factors. One, one factor is the social role of women and their roles as mothers and, and the household. And the culture, maybe? 
sorry? The culture? Uh, culture is part of it, but I think that at least culture would probably play a role after a certain level. But if public policy handles the uh, uh, equality in payroll, good transportation, imposing daycare uh, for, for institutions that have a certain number of, uh, of uh, lady employees and above, this will really improve the, the rate. And I think that with, the, with how the economic situation is in the Arab countries, it is needed that women work. And as such, I would say that the partners, the male partners, will start accepting that. Absolutely. But if you could actually serve, uh, provide, I mean, solve for the issues around, around that. And I think also one other very important thing why women entrepreneurship is very important, to start with entrepreneurship itself is very important. I mean, no country can survive without innovation today. Mm -hmm. so, so basically, innovation is such an important thing. And increasingly, women are actually uh, taking hold of, of, of more and more wealth worldwide and taking hold of more, uh, uh, they're controlling more companies, like studies show you that women would control something like $72 trillion around this year and around 163 million in the world actually yeah. are uh, can, can I ask you a companies? question here because I always wondered I hear from from colleagues and, and analysts, analysts that I interview that usually business loan applications by women are more frequently rejected than those of you know from men and usually when they are approved the women they have to pay higher rates is that true well, actually, I would say that uh, th this probably might have been the case, sometimes not necessarily because of the gender. You know, what happens is that culturally in the Arab world, for example, uh, because of the inheritance laws and because of the social norms, women own less collateral in general. So probably they own less land, they own less uh, uh, properties and so on. And number two, it's because probably women are mostly either in the SME or in the startup segments. Mm -hmm or in the home-based business segments. And these segments are generally a little bit uh, uh, less tempting for banks. But having said that, uh, I think that uh, all the programs, for example, in our case, our program does not do any, any uh, similar discrimination. And we have uh, uh, products and services tailored but to cater for But you still ask for collateral, things. no? You no, not necessarily. No. Actually, mm -hmm. uh, for in our case, we do have collateral free loans. We have startup free Good. loans for women and, and all of that. And of course, the cultural factor is very important. For example, I believe our program would have not been a success without the cultural, the, the gender training that is done across the board. Laura. So, um, for those of you that might not know UPS, we're a proud uh, logistics sponsor for Expo 2020. And um, we're a company that's engaged in delivering anywhere and everywhere around the world. 465,000 employees, many of them are women who fly our planes and drive our, our uh, package cars and tractor trailers. So for us, we deliver using women as a powerful source of our service. But we also know that there's a big world out there where the, that's untapped, and that's coming from when women entrepreneurs, from women-owned businesses. My CEO, who is an amazing he for she CEO, recognized that it was smart to invest in women-owned businesses. It wasn't just a smart thing to do or the right thing to do, but it was a good business decision. Give us and an example. Say again? So we're, we're investing in women-owned businesses by making sure that they know that they have the tools for how to export more. Because here's the reality. Only one in five exporters are women-owned businesses. We need to have every woman having the opportunity to be able to export. Why? Because that promotes more trade. UPS delivers 3% of global GDP in trade all over the world. We want to be expanding those opportunities for everyone around the world. The challenge, though, is a lot of women have a lot of barriers in their way. Um, they can't own property in certain countries. They can't access financing. They can't apply for loans. They can't move freely around a country to be able to um, uh, develop their business, showcase their business, market their business. So we are all about teaching women the tools of trade, helping them learn the tools they need to uh, export, understanding customs processes, figuring out how to package their products so that they can get anywhere and everywhere safely in the world, and being smart about those financial decisions. And so we're really excited to be partnering with WeFi in, in terms of uh, uh, showing more women-owned businesses how to have the tools and the market opportunities to be able to trade anywhere in the world. And hopefully, they end up shipping UPS. 
So. Thank you. Uh, before I, before I, I move to Michael, the only man on this panel, I, I need to tell you something about Michael. He's here for a reason. Uh, I've, I've heard you say so many times that you, were, you are not where you are today and it, if it was not for your mother. And I, I would really like you to share that with us because it's a, it's a very beautiful story. So, thank you very much and thanks to all, all of you who are here. Uh, my story is very personal. Uh, when you look at where I am today, it's because of a woman, a single mother, who lost her husband at a very young age. See, I was born in a village in Nigeria, and uh, it was a farming village, and my dad was an engineer. Those days, men went to school, women didn't go to school, even though my mom was extremely brilliant, but she, didn't, she had only eighth grade education. So when my dad died at a very young age, she was le left to raise four children all oh. by herself. And I was only four years old and the youngest child. And I can tell you, I am who I am today, where I am today when people see what I'm doing because of my mother. Because I saw how she struggled. I, I mean, she strived and then succeeded. But there was one thing that uh, she had passion for, education for her children. See, when you have a woman that is successful, the family thrives and the country thrives. But you know what is important? We all benefit. So my mom sacrificed. She would go to work uh, in the morning, and then uh, I would leave that early to go to school. After school, we met her at the farm. We had you know, late lunch at the farm. We helped her bring firewood home. And this woman worked, and I can tell you, raised children. I mean, see, I have a PhD, but I'm still the, uh, I would say, the least educated in my family, two sisters and a brother because of a woman that recognized the impact of investing in her children and in her community. And that's what brought me to where I am today. And I say it proudly because there is a, a proverb in, in the African uh, community that says, this is an idea of, I think people can live with, that we have to work together to transform this idea of engaging women in the workforce. The proverb says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. So we're in this together, and that is very, very powerful. And now, if I may pivot, I work for one of the best companies in the world, McCormick. It's the largest spice manufacturing company in the world by far. We source from over 80 communities, and most of those communities where you farm herbs and spices are impoverished. In fact, most of the places where herbs and spices grow naturally around the equator. And as our chairman says, until you move the equator, you're gonna to have to source from those communities. I don't think anybody's getting there yet. The point I'm making is this. Those communities have to be built in a way that they will survive and thrive. So at McCormick, about two years ago, actually 2017, we launched what we call purpose-led performance. What that meant is we believe that we are in a purpose economy. And put it simply, this thing says we'll deliver top-tier financial performance while doing the right things for our people, our communities, and the planet that we all share. But think about it. what does that mean? That means we're committed to doing well by doing good and impacting the communities in a very positive way. So in the farm communities, when our approach is not just to help the woman uh, uh, start her own business. Our approach is to help the woman and the community. And think about my mother value in education. So we invest not just in the women, uh, and we partner with uh, the uh, IFC, as you all know, which is part of the World Bank, and that in providing interest-free loans to, some, to these women. But we also invest in schools. We invest in water, in drinking water, and invest in hospitals. Why are we doing that? It is good for business, because those communities, the mom, like my mom, if, the, if she doesn't know where the kids are going to school, that they are safe, they are, they, are not, they are distracted from their work. So we invest in building schools very close to the farm communities, health centers very close to the farm communities, because it's also good for our business. And one, one other important thing, we are creating a standard now. When you hear about sustainable sourcing, uh, you usually hear about Rainforest Alliance, right, of uh, you know, the fair trade. That's all well and good. We use the principles and everything with Rainforest Alliance, but we're going beyond that. We are adding on top of those certifications for sustainable farming, we're also including 
community resilience, which means providing you know, capacity and capability to the community, women empowerment and gender equality, that's the third one, and the second one, and the third one, very important, ethical supply chain. What does that mean? That means that you have to pay people fairly. That means you have to provide for them, because when I hear this thing about uh, minimum wage, what does that mean? So that the person can feed their kids or send them to school like my mom did? No, we want to get fair wage to those people. And so we're removing barriers, the predatory activities in the farm activities like Madagascar, like Vietnam, like Nigeria, like India. We're eliminating that, creating co-ops where, so where they work together to set their own prices, and we commit to buying everything they produce in those sustainable way. That, to me, is the reason that I can stand, uh, sit here today and tell you I am proud of what I see in the future about women changing the world, mm. about women creating stability, about women like my mom ensuring that the children not only survive but thrive. I wouldn't be where I am today without a single mother. Thank you. <laughs> I think the beauty of it that you, you don't only uh, help societies and women, but you also have a, a, a return because big companies, they don't do anything unless they have returns. And this is a very important point that we have to raise. It's, it's that you can do good, and yet you will be financially rewarded. Heike. Yeah, thank you. I think maybe f f um, continuing on that message, I think investing in women is just good business. I mean, th so we are a development bank. We have a large mandate, but we really want to foster sustainable growth. But we really want to, we're really seeing that investing in women is good business. So, um, I mean, maybe I want to give a, a picture of how all of these elements come together. So, I'm actually an engineer by training. I also had a mother who was very technically minded and uh, encouraged me to become an engineer. And so, if you think about, and I wanted to follow up on some things that Minister Mashad said, that all of these elements need to come together to make these businesses thrive and to grew from the micro to the macro. And if we think about a car, I think it's not just the engine, it's not just the fuel that will make it go fast, the sort of the financing that will make it go fast, the liquid that will really, but it's also, it's different parts. It's the airbag, it's the regulation, it's the rules, but it's also the technology, the innovation. All of these sort of non-financial services, as we call them, they are critical to make the car work well. So for a women-owned business, I think all of these elements have to come together for it to thrive, for it to go further, to innovate more, to export, to really grow in particular from the micro enterprise to the medium to the macro. I think it was interesting to see, um, we heard uh, the accelerator presentation from Egypt today, that basically it's, it's, a, it's a tough uh, challenge to go from the very startup to the next phase of raising funds. And all of these elements that we can provide, training, mentoring, all these non-financial services, they are important and critical for, for the female-owned enterprise and also, of course, for male-owned enterprises to thrive, to integrate, and to make the next leap and to grow. So I think, for me, investing in women is good business, but it's not just about the money. I have also here a question, since you've, you've mentioned, uh, um, like, when you pitch for, um, for money, um, whether for a venture capital or any kind of fund. Um, I also heard uh, people saying that investors, they usually prefer males. So even if the, sa the content is the same, they would go for the, um, for, for the one presented or, um, I don't know, uh, done by a man. As a banker, do you think this is true? And if it's so, why? I think we still have a long way to go. So for example, I'm often on panels actually listening to pitches and making decisions for the funds that we invest in. And it also shows that you need diversity at all levels. You need diversity at the panel that judges. You need diversity at the financing institutions that uh, decides on money. And you need to support the women doing the pitches so that you know they can also be their best in front of a diverse diverse audience. So I feel there's still a long way to go. And maybe I want to give an example. I just came back from, from Cairo, and we have uh, certified the first batch of uh, women board, corporate board directors, mm -hmm. uh, Egyptian 
female board directors and a number of corporate, often family-owned businesses. And it was just amazing to see how they want to change the governance now of their company, how they want to influence the management. How So I think you need to look at all these different elements that are creating growth investments and in increase diversity, gender diversity across all of them. So that these experiences that you mentioned don't happen again, that uh, women have it uh, harder to raise funds with the same idea, with the same package, but they should have, you know, the same opportunity to get funding. Rani, I'm going to go back to, um, I am a big fan to start with. Uh, I know that you've been in, in Washington DC for so long, and then you had to come back to Egypt where you had to take some uh, roles in the government and help, and you've helped a lot empower women um, on so many uh, levels. I want you to tell me two things. One, um, how do you help women in Egypt? And I want you to tell everyone about your four C's. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy that you, uh, you follow them. Um, I think uh, before I go into that, I just want to follow up on one very important point. Actually, women are the ones who pay back loans more than men. Mm -hmm. But yes. that's a narrative that doesn't exist. Yes. And that's why we need to elevate the narrative. Uh, forums such as this, uh, workshops, um, uh, highlighting success stories over and over and over, uh, not, not feel that it's in your face sort of thing, but it's actually a responsibility. Because it's only by giving the correct stories, successful stories, there are sometimes failures, but the of successes course. are more. And by pushing that, you actually open the doors for more women to come in, Absolutely. and therefore the gains for society, for economy, etc., become uh, become there. So, so for example, uh, um, on the financing gap, women in the Middle East, uh, when it comes to uh, small and medium enterprises and, and entrepreneurship, they need a financing gap of around $16 billion. Wow. In Egypt, that financing gap is maybe $4 billion. Wow. Um, so uh, the, the but financial... we have cash, right? We, we have, don't have a tight liquidity. But, but the, the issue is the financial inclusion. Mm. This idea of women having access, uh, women having bank accounts, uh, and uh, having the, um, uh, the guts, if you will, having the encouragement, uh, to, and that's where policy comes in. So we have a central bank initiative for financial inclusion, including women, including programs for women uh, that show that um, uh, if they do participate, the outcome is big. And therefore, the idea of policy, partnership, and private sector all together, this is really what will push the message. But again, the narrative is extremely important, and it is not to be belittled. Coming back to your question about myself, um, I think that the best way to help women is to provide good role models um, and to show that uh, you should not um, shy away from taking responsibility. Uh, I grew up being gender blind completely, so I, 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 uh, you just had to be good in your school, get educated well, do well in interviews, keep on pushing. Um, and the four C's that you talk about are really the pillars of my own success, and I always talk about them. It's number one, competence. You have to be competent at Absolutely. whatever you, uh, you do. Uh, and that goes, or you get this competency through education and through having a niche that everyone recognizes. The second is connections. Yes. And connections are not to be belittled, but nobody wants to connect with you unless you're competent. Com absolutely. So it's not just uh, connections for the sake of it, but you have to really, and one, one connection brings you to someone else just if you are competent. Mm -hmm. the, th the third one is confidence. And there's a very uh, silver lining between confidence and arrogance. Absolutely. And that comes from your competence. If you are competent, you bring your subject matter to life. Uh, in a very uh, entertaining way. People trust you. you, you create that credibility around you. And then the, four, the, fifth, the fourth one, uh, which is charm. Yeah. Um, I have and been, you do <laughs> have that. <laughs> I have been in rooms where I'm the only woman. I don't see that. I don't want to be the only in the room, but I want to be the best in the room. Yeah. And that is very important. You have to be aware of your surrounding. I've always been with older men. I know better. How do I address that? I have been with subordinates who are twice my age. How do I deal with that? So there's, uh, there's this emotional intelligence that comes uh, over time. So I'm, ha I'm very happy that uh, I, I'm able to be uh, an example for other women through my policy work when I was Minister of Tourism uh, we had initiatives to encourage women in the workforce today as uh, Minister of International Cooperation I look forward to a lot of partnerships with international community to again 
uh, direct the narrative in a conducive way and to push the agenda forward. Thank you. Nadia, you've launched um, a program with the IFC called Suruk. Tell us more about it and what you're doing for women in Jordan. Yeah, well, we launched that program uh, in 2014. It was the first full banking proposition uh, for women in Jordan. And we felt that we had to claim the first uh, mover advantage because of who we are. Our organization, the Bank Bank Al-Ittihad, is known to be a very uh, uh, um, a gender or women's uh, supporting organization by DNA. So we felt we do have uh, uh, something to back it up. And you know, because people, if you don't walk the talk, as they say, people will not take you seriously. So in our organization, um, we're more than 45% women. Actually, if you remove the support functions, we're 50%. And um, we, I mean, like uh, referring to the morning uh, talk by uh, the president of the World Bank, we tick all the boxes. We are it in terms of equality in pay, in uh, gender, in, in uh, no tolerance for uh, any biases, in terms of benefits, in terms of maternity breaks, daycare, anything you name it. So basically, we decided we're going to do that. And um, of course, there was a huge business case. I mean, there's a big uh, financing gap in Jordan. It has to be business. We're a bank at the end of the day. And at the time, it was around $600 million, which is substantial for Jordan. And maybe 15% um, of companies at the time were owned or managed by women, but only 5% really got access to finance, and 27% of women in Jordan had uh, access to finance. So we launched this program, and it is a women in the market program because of the size of Jordan. It's not very big, so it addresses women as business leaders, as women professionals, and as uh, in their capacity also as uh, the leaders of the household as well. Uh, the program, of course, had a financial side and a non-financial side. The financial side, naturally, all the bank services and products are available to women. But having said that, we believe that it's very important to understand the segment you're serving and to cater to the needs. So as I said earlier, we launched collateral free loans. We launched startup loans for women. Uh, we actually gave special saving accounts for women, special products like insurance, wealth management, and so on for women. But the other pillar, which was the non-financial services, was major and would not have been a success without it. So we launched a full program that actually gives financial literacy, mentorships, training, uh, networking opportunities. Uh, we launched an award that has three categories, one for SME, one for uh, um, a women-led startup, and one for a startup in general. And we're so proud that this is the sixth or seventh year where most of the people who qualify for the three categories are women. And it's been a great uh, opportunity. The results actually have been amazing. Um, I mean, looking back now, our, uh, now 36% of our customers are women. And our uh, women uh, portfolio, women client portfolio, grew six times. Our lending portfolios grew six times. Our deposit portfolios grew five times. Our non-performing loans ratio is, is, is great. When it comes to women, it's about 3%. That compares to 9.7% for men. And for example, like only in 2019 alone, around 1,600 ladies benefited from our non-financial services and made huge impact. Actually, it made us so proud last year when the WEF launched the, the list of the 100 most influential startups in the Middle East. 27 of those were Jordanian and six were women and they are all in our network. Oh. So basically, we're so proud. And uh, now our bank has been doing a lot of work on digital. Uh, so basically, we're moving into a lot of digital services and um, remains to be seen. But from what we've seen, the uptake is great. Almost in one year, 88% uh, of our customers actually have shifted to, to digital, the retail customers. So we think that this will also hopefully bring a big opportunity to the, to the women as well, because it's also easier access. Good luck. Good luck. Mm -hmm. uh, Laura, looking at the women in the C-suite, there are few women uh, in that suite. Uh, isn't it a missed opportunity? Absolutely. Especially that, like when, when we hear about how committed they yeah. are, how optimistic about business in general, women are always more optimistic than men. Right. Um, I, I was going to pick up on one Please. thing from the gentleman to my left. <laughs> I was going to say, you know who inspired me? 
It, no. My mom gave me birth, oh. but it was my father who gave me the voice and the courage. Oh. It was my brother who stood by my side and my amazing husband. And so for all the men in the audience, we need a lot more he for she men yes. championing women. That's how we rise. Yes. Because so, the reality is the world, many of the economic levers, the political levers are controlled by men. And men can decide a lot of things right now in terms of whether opportunities are given in a gender blind way or whether they're given in more traditional ways that have held women back. And so from that perspective, my appeal is to all the men in the room, including my CEO, who put me in this very senior position because I had the four C's and he didn't look at me as just the woman. He knew I was the person that could get the job done. That's what's going to uh, result in a lot more change. Um, I would also say the second most important thing in terms of um, empowering women is giving them a legal foundation to stand on. And I'm going to come back to the C-suite yes. question. But women need a legal foundation. When I look at my entire career, I made it because there were opportunities created because there were legal openings or there were legal opportunities that said, well, a woman can do that job. Nobody would expect a woman to be in logistics, driving a, a, a truck or a package car or flying planes when I was starting out my career. But it was through systematic change, ending the ban on women in certain lines of employment or changing the laws that said, yes, a woman can be on the front lines of diplomacy and doesn't need to resign if she gets pregnant or she gets married, because we want to have the voice of our country represented on the front lines no matter what. It doesn't always need to be a man. When laws were changed, opportunities were created. And I, I totally agree with you. The rules of business are changing. Yes. And the women are definitely in the forefront of this transformation. But for women to get to the C-suite, we need a strong legal foundation. Absolutely. And the World Bank has done an amazing report called the Women, uh, it's a Women in Law um, uh, uh, Business Report, which basically ranks countries by all the different laws that they have in place, many of which restrict women from being able to engage in business. Women give them the chance. Um, they will flourish. They will thrive if they don't have to do it with their hands tied behind their backs, so Absolutely. to speak. If they don't have all the limitations. So we need to be championing for the reform in the laws. We need to change a lot of other things so that women yeah. can get to the C-suite. But we need the legal foundation, Trust, which is why, to everyone in the room, we need you championing for legal change that is brought about at the World Trade Organization. We need a trade in initiative that changes the commitments that countries have undertaken to make trade obligations gender blind. Women should have access to every single trade uh, obligation that every country has taken. And that's an easy change to make. It just takes courage at the senior levels in every single government to make that change. And then you know what you're going to see? A lot more businesses being established established because they have a legal foundation. A lot more women thriving in their own businesses or businesses that they can be a part of. And sooner or later, all of them will be able to rise to the most senior levels when given the opportunity to, to do so. And then you know what? When, when the world is held up half by men and half by women, the world's a lot stronger when there's that balance in place. Absolutely. I'll come back. I'll come back to you about policies that we need to put in place. But before that, Michael, you have something to say. I, yes, I do. Um, I, I want to build on what my colleague up here is saying uh, from UBS. Um, we have enshrined this, some of the things that you're advocating in our purpose-led performance at McCormick. We made a commitment aligned with the UN Sustainable Development Goals that by 2025, we will have 50% of our executive leadership will be women. You can, you can do that. We just issued a report. <laughs> Thank you. So we've, not too many uh, companies would come out and make that type of audacious commitment. We're blessed to have a chairman, Lawrence Cosius, who believes in that. In fact, he's a champion. He put me in that. In fact, he said, who has to lead this type of function? So I co-chair the proposed Lake Performance Governance Council. Who has to lead it than like somebody who grew up with exactly what we're trying to do? See, you just can't say it and hope it will happen. Hope is not a strategy. Mm -hmm. You have to put it in place. We've enshrined it. We've published it. And we issued it in 2017. And as of this January, when we issued our two-year report, 
we're already tracking at 30 something percent. We, but here is the thing, you have to take a holistic approach. You can say that and say, well, I have very few women. Or you can say that and then put things in place, training, recruitment practices, you're right, rules of the road that would allow you to bring more women into, into the executive level. And from there, you provide them support. So people talk about diversity. What does that mean if you can't include them in the meetings? That's a waste of time. True. So when you talk about uh, inclusion and equity, it means you have to do much more than we've been saying. And so that's the commitment we have for our own organization. So we're building this idea of women inclusion everywhere in our value chain, we call it, including in our own C-suite. But we're doing something much more than that. In the farm communities, we are empowering women to lead cooperatives. We are working with uh, NCB Eclusa in some of the major farm communities, like in Madagascar, in Vietnam, in India. We are having cooperatives that are run by the farmers themselves. We are eliminating middlemen. I call them henchmen. When I grew up, my mom, they have to sell their crops to a middleman, which in my language is a henchman, sells to another henchman at the end, these farmers are impoverished. The henchmen are driving Mercedes-Benz. We're about to change that. That's why we create a co-op, so that these women themselves will benefit from their effort. And men as well. It's not just them. And so what is happening is we're also committing to taking everything they produce that's, and giving them a premium on that. But we eliminate the middlemen. They get more money, and now they can afford to support their children. That's the type of thing that you have to do to ensure that in the entire value chain from farm in our business through the, uh, all the manufacturing all the way to the C-suite that you have women empowered to lead. Because where they lead, like my mom, look at the result. You know, and I want to just pick yeah. up on one point that he made. If your company is uh, focused on doing that by 2025, there's a really powerful statistic that McKinsey has done. Mm. It said that if you eliminate all the barriers to women, provide equal opportunity, just like your company is doing, by 2025, if you did that, you would advance that WTO initiative Excellent. or the World Trade Organization. Excellent. You know what you'd get? you'd get 26% GDP growth. You'd Excellent. get $28 trillion in Excellent. the global economy. Excellent. I think that is something that's pretty darn exciting in terms of growth and opportunity. And so one company does it. We need every company exactly. doing that. We need every company eliminating those barriers. And we need governments changing the laws because that kind of growth potential yep leads to a lot of uh, yeah. prosperity, a lot of stronger families, communities, yeah. and countries. And Absolutely. we need more and, and you know men what? like Michael. And, and you know what? I want to tell you one thing. Look at our, our, our stock. Mm -hmm. It's gone like this. When all the food companies are stagnating, our own is going like this. So this idea of doing well, doing the right things by doing good works. And I think we're living an example for that. And yes. I agree with you. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think I, I, I find this quite fascinating that a lot of the initiatives are coming from the private sector. So yes. I think, you know, private companies, private banks, they're really taking the initiative because they're really having seen and experienced in their business the advantages that this can bring. And I think, of course, development banks like, like the one I'm working for, the EBID, we can support this. But I think it's great that before it was coming often from governments alone, and alone this cannot be changed. And yes. I think it's great to see that companies are now asking for this and they are actually, in some cases, leading the way, setting actually more ambitious targets than the respective governments. And I think what we also see with our Women in Business program that we're doing across our economies. I wanted to economies. ask you about that, actually, yeah, if you I can think, tell I mean, us more. I mean, we've, yes, we've lent a half a billion euros, but I think that's the, the smallest bit of it. It's actually empowering companies who want to do the right mm -hmm. thing with advice, with mentoring, with connecting. So connecting smaller companies to the likes of you, the, yes. big, the big players in mm -hmm. the room, the big girls and boys that are, sort of that are sort of influencing the value chain and making sure that the whole value chain becomes inclusive. But I think the great trend that we're seeing is big companies are actually now leading the way and are wanting to improve the value chain in terms of inclusiveness. And I think that's something where where we need to support as development financing institutions. Of course, governments are already doing their bit, but I think that is great to see that there's a shift in mindset. One doesn't need to wait 
till you know um, there's some regulation that is everywhere. I, we do have to have these building blocks, but a company, um, particularly the big multinationals, they can lead the way, they can pull the whole SME segment in the respective value chains along, and I hope that we can give liquidity and what we can do as an organization like the EBRD is matchmaking. I think a lot of what you do here, the connectivity C, I think that's really critical in terms of you know, bringing this uh, to fruition and accelerating this. I've got only five minutes left. We're, we're running out of time. Um, I, would, I would ask you about the message you would like to take from this discussion, or uh, m maybe you can tell us about some policies you have in mind, anything that will help, you know, like being part of the government, empowering women. So uh, first of all, um, Egypt in 2017 announced the, the, the Year of Women, and that was something new. The National Council of Women uh, reports to the president. There's political will. Uh, to do things related to regulation, political empowerment of women. Now we have uh, more than 25% uh, of the cabinet are women, uh, eight ministers. Uh, I was the first minister of tourism in Egypt's history, True. and that was a bet. It's not my field, but I got the highest revenues in Egypt's history in tourism, so that was uh, good. Uh, there's economic empowerment that is also taking place. So when you take a look at uh, some of the uh, uh, rules related to uh, accessibility uh, to banks, uh, and uh, a fintech trying to use that technology and, and empower uh, women. Uh, and then there's the social element uh, through uh, better uh, targeted messaging uh, when it comes to the social norms and so forth. I think that for every uh, woman uh, in government, through po I am, I'm a macroeconomist, so I believe in policy frameworks and, and, and when you do things at the top, they do trickle down. Um, and the private sector today, especially corporates, whether it's the environment or inclusion, this is the way your stock is going to go up. Yeah. So there, it, people do expect responsible business and do expect a lot from CEOs and their, and their uh, trust in CEOs is sometimes bigger than governments. And that's where the partnership uh, and the stakeholder partnership should come in uh, all the time. But for every woman who is in public office, I feel that our responsibility is double. We have to do our own job for the portfolio that we hold, but we also uh, have to do a good job to open the door for other women in this space. If we say that uh, uh, you need women on, on boards, you need women on uh, panels, the only way to get there is if the women before them have done a good job so that people trust that they can continue doing a good job. Just one thing I will conclude with, our financial regulation authority uh, passed an amendment in December that every company has to have at least one board member that is a woman. So this is also, through regulation, a way to push when it comes to women empowerment. SDGs are around the corner, um, and uh, uh, for uh, the parity, which is the SDG number five, unless you work more on women, we will not be able to get the other 16 as well. So that's the message I would have. Yeah, well, I think... Thank you. Um, I think what's clear, the takeaway that is clear is uh, the huge opportunity. I mean, all the numbers, all the discussion is leading to, to how huge this opportunity is. And um, I would say that to serve women, you will have to understand this segment. You'll have to do tailor-made solutions. You'll have to work a lot on the data because the, the gender segregated data is not available and you have to measure what you do. And of course, you need corporate culture. Probably we've always talked about education in general and the need to educate women, but what I would say that in, the, in today's world with this all shift towards technology, I think this could be either a great opportunity for women or it could be a disabler for women if women are not channeled to STEM education, science, technology, and math, because I mean, this could be a scene changer if women were well educated to really uh, actually probably uh, jump the barriers, and if not, this could really take us to square one again. So my bottom line message is we just need more he for she men. We need more men championing women. We've so, made great life partners. We make even better business partners. And so we want to see more opportunity created. How does that come about? It comes from recognizing that it's smart business to invest in women, but it also comes in public-private partnerships. We need to have 
private sector engaged with governments, creating the change in terms of the laws, and fostering the kind of training programs that allow women to be able to flourish and thrive on the global scene. And companies like UPS, we're going to invest in that every single time, because like you said, it's good business, and there's a world of trade out there that's been untapped, and it's going to be led by women going forward, and we want to be a part of that growth. Okay. Yeah. My me simple message is empowering women is good for business. You can look at our stocks. But you cannot do it unless we take a holistic approach, like having daycare close to where they work, like having schools close to where they work. If we do all of that, the future bodes well for our world. And remember, the world is flat. Thank you. <laughs> It's always a bit difficult to be uh, at the end of such an amazing panel in terms of uh, final words. But I think I do believe investing in women is not only good business, but it's really the way forward for more innovation. So I think this will actually lead for more diversity, will create better ideas, more ideas, ideas that will actually bear fruition in more um, inclusive economic growth. I have a message um, before we wrap up. I am here with four successful women if there were uh, glass ceilings, they have definitely smashed it. So I, I always say, if you can dream it, you can do it. So believe in yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's awesome to meet you, my friend. Yeah.